So yeah, welcome everybody to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Really so happy to be here with you all. It's been a couple weeks for me. I'm Eve Ekman. I share this night with Chandra Easton. And so because of the holiday and, and her being here, it just, yeah, it's a real treat to be back and to see that the space is literally coming alive. For those online, there's kind of um, all these new plants that are literally hanging out as well near us a new tea station. So just really feeling like this center continues to kind of grow um, and become more uh, beautiful. And also as a reminder, the San Francisco Dharma Collective is totally volunteer run. There's no big boss. There's just a lot of folks with a lot of heart who want to have a space to practice the Dharma together. So I really like to mention that because it kind of primes us to be here floating on generosity. Like everything that happens here, the cookies that some very kind individual cooked for us, um, the paint on the walls, all of this is the generosity of folks really using the center as a place to practice. So yeah, welcome for folks who maybe it's their first time. Welcome to the friends here who come a lot. Tonight, I'm really excited. A little, I'm sorry, it's a little bit of a surprise, but we are going to start a new book. So often we, often we start, um, often we use books and this practice of kind of learning and reviewing and then meditating. And Chandra and I have been going back and forth for a couple of weeks about what was next. And today I just threw down the gauntlet and I was like, it is going to be Old Path White Clouds. So this is a really interesting book. Has anyone read this book in the room? Okay, it's uh, it is it's interesting. It's written by Thich Nhat Han or compiled by Thich Nhat Han, and his intention with this book is to make the life of the Buddha super relatable. So he stitches together a lot of stories. Some of them are folk stories. Some of them are written. Some of them were orally transmitted for a thousand years before they were written down. But to piece together the actual life of Buddha, uh, Siddhartha. And I'll be honest, when I first heard about this book, I was, I did think it sounded extremely boring and probably not that relevant for my practice. You know, it's, yeah, okay, you know, that's where it came from, but we're here and we're now. And as some folks know, I, I really bring in a lot of contemporary psychology to our practices. And I was not certain that there would be that level of kind of human emotion to make it come alive. Uh, I've now read this book four times. I find it to be super inspiring and really also somewhat, I don't know the right word, but maybe just comforting. So the book is organized in different chapters and throughout the chapters, all the basic four foundations of mindfulness are covered and in order of how the Buddha himself learned them. So we think of these teachings of the Buddha and unlike the 10 commandments, right? They didn't just come down written on stone. They were all discovered. They were all revealed to him through his exploration of the human mind, of consciousness and of attention. And he was really not one for dogma or doctrine. He wasn't sitting there looking at all the texts and trying to come up with an idea of enlightenment. He really experienced it. And after, you know, his own awakening, many, 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 many times tried to refine the lessons and the guideposts so that all of us could also wake up. And so I find the book to be super useful because it's almost like a linear progression of how his teachings evolved. And it starts, you know, very simply um, in these first couple chapters. So we're, we'll get to the kind of teachings one by one, but tonight we'll just start a little bit about kind of the early life um, and early practices of this great teacher. I really recommend the book. You don't need it uh, to attend these classes and um, totally voluntary, but sometimes it's really nice to, to have it. And it is, yeah, just a book I find really comforting. I enjoy reading before bed. And I know that if I read, for example, a science fiction novel, I'll be up for five hours. And if it's the news, I go kind of agitated. And this is like oh, such a sweet way to bring yourself to sleep. I uh, will often read a little bit in the morning. So just as a nice compliment to your practice. And it's not hard. It's not these you know, philosophical treaties on consciousness. It's stories that bring these ideas to life. So 
that's what we'll be starting tonight. And in honor of this book and these teachings, we'll start with one of my favorite practices, which is one of the first that's described in the book. And that's a mindfulness of phenomena. And mindfulness of phenomena is a practice where we really start attending closely to each of our sense portals, not because it's so important to notice the subtle smell that we can notice or notice all the sensations in our body, but it gives us a really interesting and clear target to monitor all the shifts and changes through our sense portals. What I think is interesting with this practice is right now we're really engaging in our listening, maybe a little bit of our looking around, but when we open up to all the sense portals, so much more data and information there. And this practice is one I come back to often as a way to help stabilize and ground. Sometimes if your general practice is a mindfulness of breathing or an open awareness, it's a little, what's the word? It can be a little too subtle. This practice I think is like a, it gives you some greater reins on the wild stallion of the mind. So that's what we'll start with. Then I'll read a bit. It's in the, this book also, it's like story time. It's so sweet. You know, it's all these little stories about the Buddha and he goes through many experiences of his past lives. So whether or not you believe it, no problem. But the Buddha, when he was awakened, was able to remember every single lifetime up until this one, uh, which is also comforting because you realize that it took him thousands of lifetimes to wake up and it might take us at least that though we can get ourselves on the way. And as you see in each of the lifetimes, whether he's a tree or a turtle or a prince, each of these lifetimes, he's really polishing his compassion more and more and more. And that's a kind of inspiring way to see all of our challenges and foibles along the way is kind of polishing our compassion. So without further ado, go ahead and find a posture that will support you. Probably do a gatika, so a 24-minute sit together. I think it's okay. Yeah, thank you. And so especially, I think we have some new folks with us tonight. So if it's your first time here, you know, feel free to have your eyes slightly open and even give yourself a chance to kind of look around the room and feel a sense of presence and hopefully a sense of knowing where you are located in this space. We want to find an upright spine. A sense of our dignity, our uprightness. But not a rigidity, almost as though it was a stalk of a beautiful flower raising itself up to the sun. And then imagining the front of the body, the face and the chest and the belly, finding greater and greater ease. As we start to settle into the body, we will notice what might be tight or busy, what might feel dull or tired. And giving yourself a moment here to adjust the body in a way that feels comfortable. Allowing the hands to rest on the lap in a way that doesn't strain the shoulders. Noticing where the chin is pointing. Is it sloping forward and straining the back of the head?
and really, really deeply softening the eyes. Whether open or closed, it's giving that invitation to rest, to turn the gaze completely inward as though staring at your own heart. As we begin to settle into the body, we can allow our senses to be just open, not preferring what we're hearing or feeling or maybe smelling, allowing our senses to be open and to let our attention roam freely. And gently inviting the attention to descend a bit more fully into the body. Feeling a sense of the body in the space of the room around us. Noticing where the seams of our skin meets the air. And taking a moment and noticing and feeling into the back of the body. And then shifting to notice and attend to the front of the body. and attending to a sense of what is above the body, the ceiling, the sky. A sense of what is below the immediate support of a cushion or a chair. And of course, the earth. Feeling this sense of our body located in space and whether online or here in person, feeling a sense of being part of a constellation of bodies.
Just the most simple presence of togetherness. And with this process of locating ourselves here in this moment, in this place, in this shared space, we can consider an intention or motivation that has brought us here or inspired us to practice this evening. This intention can reflect really what's here now, not only an idea or ideal of where our practice may take us, but a sense of where we are in this moment and what qualities we most aspire to. Finding a word or phrase that really kind of shines and feeling that as a source of inspiration and light. As we enter the practice, remembering that each time we notice our mind has become distracted or slipped away, it's an incredible opportunity for gentleness and care and is the foundation for strengthening our introspection, our attention. So when we notice our mind slips away to a to-do list or a memory, an image or idea, we just relax. And then gently release whatever has captured our attention and return. We can imagine this tour of our sense portals as directing the searchlight of our attention and awareness we begin by directing this searchlight to the sensations in the body. Allowing whatever we experience in the body to simply be experienced. No need to make a story about it, even to label it. Noticing areas of warmth or coolness, movement or heaviness, really harnessing this bright attention and awareness to whatever can be noticed through the body.
no agenda, no expectation. Noticing what might arise as we fully bring our attention into the body. And then we will gently shift, directing this searchlight now <clears throat> to the sense portal of sound. Noticing whatever can be noticed through hearing. And as much as possible, once again, doing so very simply. Not hearing and noticing, oh, that's the Muni, or that's a car alarm. Noticing the quality of sound. The volume, the duration, the tone. The sound of your own breath, the sound in the room and outside the room. Receive the sound, not leaning towards it. as much as possible, not, not fixating on any sound, whether it's a background sound of a heater or the low hum of another electronic in the room. Not getting sticky with it, just noticing, receiving the sound. Again, remembering every time we get distracted, not a problem. An opportunity for gentleness and strengthening this incredible power of introspection and attention and coming back. Couple more moments here, receiving sound and letting whatever is heard be simply heard. And then we'll gently shift for a shorter amount of time to the sense portals of smell and taste. 
This might be quite subtle, maybe the residue of a meal or tea. Maybe we can smell the shampoo of our hair or our clothing, the detergent. Again, allowing whatever is experienced through the sense portal of taste and smell to be experienced so simply. And to prepare for our shifting to the sense portal of sight, what can be seen, we'll gently lower our head so that our chin is pointed directly down to our chest. And with our closed eyes, we're gazing downward into our lap. And before we open our eyes, really imagining as though this were the very first time we were seeing Instead of thinking, these are my hands or my feet, experiencing color and shape and shadow and light, subtle movement, without expectation, just receiving, very gently allowing the eyes to open <coughs> and seeing what can be seen. Allowing the gaze to be soft, noticing what can be seen in the periphery of the vision. And notice this type and quality of seeing without needing to understand, without seeking out. But without dullness, not falling asleep or spaced out, just a soft, relaxed seeing. And gently allowing the eyes to close, noticing 
maybe the light impressions even behind the eyelids. And gently returning the head to rest evenly on top of the neck. And shifting to this great sense portal of perception. Just as we directed our searchlight to what is felt and what is heard, what is tasted and smelled and seen, we direct our attention now to the space of the mind and the thoughts that arise within it. As though we were leaning back in our mind, we observe the thoughts arising. And without getting stuck, allow them to just naturally slip away, returning to whence they came. Just as we notice the sounds coming and going, without labeling or engaging, noticing the contents of the mind. In order to do so, it can be very helpful to just feel a sense of relaxation and ease in the body. And inviting a spaciousness and openness to the quality of how we observe the mind and the thoughts that arise within it. Maybe the thoughts feel just incessant, one after the other, one after the other. Maybe there's some gaps in between the thoughts where the spaciousness of mind can be glimpsed even briefly. If there's dullness or sleepiness, again, no problem. It's refreshing the attention to the space of the mind. Feel or imagine the space of the mind. Our awareness is unbounded, not behind our eyes or between our ears. That can be experienced throughout the body, throughout the space around us.
inviting now a full field of experience, a richness of all the sense portals. Still <clears throat> noticing the space of the mind, also aware of the sensations in the body, the sounds, any smells or tastes, and any light impressions behind closed eyes, or if the gaze is open, the light and color. And feel a sense of rich presence opening through all these sense portals without expectation and without stickiness to anything that arises and passes. Feeling the fullness of this high saturation presence through our sense portals. And feeling the fluidity of allowing everything to pass through. Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> Seeing if we can shift from the meditation into the different experience of discussing and reflecting, but bringing that quality of fully being here all the sense portals. Any questions or reflections on the practice? And Cage, do we have a mic we're passing tonight? Okay, sweet, thank you. Yeah, anyone want to share anything about their practice? Question about the practice? Is there a sense? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, it was hardest for me to stay with the meditation when I opened my eyes. Yeah. Because I just felt more distracted. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how many eyes. Yes. I, uh, very normal. Can you say your name? Amy. Amy, thanks. Um, I think that's very normal. And um, I'm curious when you say distracted, was it thoughts 
or distracted by what you were seeing? Yes. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, for those online who, who didn't hear that, you know, the, the shift of opening the eyes, it's not only the stimulation of what we see, but also the sense of, wow, there's, there's a lot to see. And there's a lot of seers even, right, in the room. It's so interesting how dominant we are with the sense portal of sight. And I'm, I'm sure many of you um, maybe have seen or know about some of the research studies, like looking at when we really try to strengthen these other sense portals, so much more is there. There's like, there's like a whole world that's available to us. Um, and I think with sight, it's, it's a really tough one to not get sticky. Uh, the practice that I learned and, and that I really love is to get into a horizon. And so when we have a clear horizon, so if you're out at Ocean Beach or on the top of a hill here, you have a lot of space, a lot of space. And you see kind of the hill and then you see the sky and it's just engaging enough and just boring enough that the eyes can really relax. Because it's so, so interesting. Again, this instead of like seeing something, this kind of seeing something. It's that quality that we're bringing like across our meditation practices of an attention that is bright, but not tight, right? That's really kind of up, but also at ease. And to do that seeing. So some people may be familiar here with Tonka paintings. And these are paintings that are designed for meditation. So they're like stimulating for us, but also they have a sense of expansion within them. So giving us, I mean, they, they have many purposes, um, as well as kind of imagining deities and yourself as deities, a whole other thing. But I, I think a lot of them also give us this, this plateau. And it is, it's, it's also distracting because it's like, you're like, oh, the, oh man, there's a stain on my pants and socks definitely don't match. And right, there's a lot of material. But I think in general, we were really stimulated and you notice this cognitively, Right when we see, because we're so accustomed to seeing in order to know or to think. So that's great noticing. Yeah, and let me know how it goes with the, the horizon practice. It's one of my favorite. It's for especially finding a sense of spacious awareness. I think it can really allow us to feel that. So yeah, anyone else can have a question or comment on the practice. Yes, wonderful. Hi, my name is Kelly. Um, pronouns is them. And I just want to comment. I came in late and just sort of surprisingly just dropped right in. Mm. Um, and then the invitation to sleep to open our eyes was actually so visually exciting mm. like just all this visual splendor mm. because I'm just looking at like oh my god everything looked like art you know <laughs> and then it like fringes on the jaw ridges of the sweater or the weave of the jeans or the little subtle shadow cast under the edge of the leather. <laughs> like everything was and it was um and I have to say it's at the expense of being really corny even that chord like that, <laughs> yeah. oh God, just really, it was just really pleasurable. Mm, that's, wonderful. That's what I can say. It yeah. Was truly pleasurable. Yeah. To no, really notice. Mm. Um, and yeah. Yeah. That's what I'll say. About it. Thank you. Everything was alive. And, yeah. Um, just all the shapes and, and, subtleties were yeah totally exciting yeah that's wonderful and did it feel like distracting or more kind of just um I guess engaging not distracting yeah um it was just like this noticing um but sort of a deeper wow 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I know you've had, um, you know, retreat experience and it, that sounds like retreat experience where everything takes on this kind of brightness. Yeah. yeah and I was actually surprised that I had that reaction because I was walking here fast. Mm -hmm. I was like, um, eating as I'm walking. Just totally experience wonderful yeah it's yeah. Very cool. yeah yeah thank you and it's interesting uh a little bit of a segue into old path white clouds a lot of the detail and the richness in this book is is like how buddha is living with his whole retinue of monks you know and and they are every single time they eat completely silent and some of us have done this on retreat or otherwise that it has that kind of, um, you know, just high fidelity of experience when we're eating without, you know, thinking about what we're going to say next, uh, speaking, responding. It's also really depressing, at least for me, <laughs> eating on retreat. I'm always like, oh my God, just wanting that like joy of conversation. But if you can push through that uh, resistance to it, there's just so much more to our food than we're generally aware of. So that's a reminder. And everywhere, um, everywhere they go, these monks, you know, he starts off, of course, with his own, only three of his friends who are with him and quickly grows to 100, 200, 300, 400. Everywhere they go, they travel by foot. They could take carriages and horses, they're offered rides. But this idea of it's like the pace that our attention and awareness can actually be is that walking posture. And I think I, I'm going to push it and say, I think bicycle counts too, but I, I certainly feel more present and aware of what's going on. If I'm walking, um, usually riding my bike, um, even if I'm like slightly in a rush though, the, the whole purpose of the walking meditation of Buddha and his disciples is to both always barefoot, to feel the earth, and also really to have this sense of kind of in that natural rhythm and not rushing through, not pushing through. So really lovely. Anyone else, a question or reflection before we move into the first couple chapters here? Online, anyone there? How y'all doing? Okay, good. So as I, as I mentioned, you know, this book is a whole series um, of stories. And in these first couple chapters, uh, it's kind of giving us an invitation to start glimpsing um, what it's like in the life of the Buddha when he is a little more established. So he uses an interesting method here where he has a, of course, the Buddha is the main protagonist in the book. But the other main character in the book is uh, this character named Svasti, who is often referred to as the, the buffalo boy or the water buffalo boy. And when Buddha is on his way to truly awakening under the tree, of course, we've all heard that part of the story. He's actually, there's a group of children who are with him in the forest. They kind of come upon him and see this hermit, which at the time was fairly usual. Like, oh yeah, there's another person seeking enlightenment, right? There's actually many roving groups of different types of spiritual practice. Some, some that are doing intense deprivation. Let's not eat anything except for, you know, basically living on air. And then some that are worshiping fire. Let's throw everything into the fire. So many different groups at this time who are spiritual seekers. So these children, uh, these two children, the Buffalo boy and another girl named Sujata separately run into the Buddha. And yet they are so struck by the kindness and the presence of this being. It just, they feel like seeing him, they are held in love in a way they've never known, which is, touches my heart. I've uh, had the, the great good fortune to be with some pretty accomplished teachers um, and spiritual um, practitioners. And I have had a glimpse of that, right? Where you're, they see you 
And it's not like you, who you are, your identity, your personhood. It's like just the seeing you with these eyes of love and compassion. That's just really beautiful. Um, so really nice to hear that part captured. And one part I think is so interesting about using Svasti as a main protagonist in this book, it says a lot about Thich Nhat Hanh. Many of you know Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, he spoke a lot about interbeing, the importance of Buddhism not being just about our experience, but creating community and creating social change and engaged Buddhism. And one of the first acts that the Buddha does with, you know, just as right before his awakening and then right after is he essentially <laughs> dismisses outright the caste system in India. And the caste system in India, for those of you who don't know, is rigid and extremely hierarchical, maybe just a, a more visible version of inequality that we see today. And then the Buffalo boy is at the lowest level of that caste system. He is what's called an untouchable. And these are groups who, of people who are born in the wrong place. Uh, and according to the law of the time, they're only permitted to live outside the village, only permitted to do just the worst work, you know, really the lowest work. And when uh, Svasti, this Buffalo boy, first encounters the Buddha, he is drawn to him, you know, this magnetism of feeling that sense of being held in love, but he's also afraid. He can tell, he's like, oh, wow. At the time, as is written in the book, if an untouchable, even on accident, touches a member of a different class, they are punished. They're beaten, right? They, you know, it's extreme. And so Svasti comes close. He's next to um, the Buddha. And all of a sudden he holds himself back very nervous, like, wow, what if I end up touching him and, and getting in trouble? And the Buddha just outright says, those are stories and they're not true. And I want to share a little bit of, of how he says this. Um, just, just so simple. Right before. right before. Yeah, this is him in the forest. So again, we've heard him under the Bodhi tree. It's actually called a Pipala tree before it becomes the Bodhi tree. And he is sitting there walking the river. And this is where he runs into the this sweet young Svasti. And he says, mm-hmm. because this is the conditioning that the boy has grown up in. He says, when I touch you like this, aren't you being polluted? So that's the kind of dehumanizing language of that time. The untouchables would, would pollute others. Uh, and, he, and Buddha laughed and shook his head. Not at all, child. You're a human being and I'm a human being. You can't pollute me. Don't listen to what people tell you. And um, he goes on, Many times after that, when new disciples want to join and they become worried or afraid that they won't be accepted, Buddha made quite a big splash in his time after he started gathering more and more disciples because all the princes and all of the wealthy merchant son in the land were running off in order to join and it was actually kind of threatening to the society itself to have so many people who were supposed to be in power, who were supposed to be leading these kingdoms, really deciding that what was more important was this life of awakening. And so you have this incredible combination of, you know, an entire spectrum of what the society had created in terms of inequality, practicing together just really beautiful. I, I think many people know that aspect of the Buddha's first actions or the Buddha's story, but I don't think we highlight it quite enough. Um, yeah, and another part in these first couple chapters that I thought would be nice for us to think about is, so the this buffalo boy, when when he meets the Buddha, he's he's 10 years old. And he's been through quite a bit of hardship. His father died six years earlier, and his mother died during the, the birth of his youngest sister. 
And so he is kind of alone looking out for his family. And after the Buddha wakes up, becomes enlightened, Svasti says, I so want to learn from you. And the Buddha promises him, I'll be back and I will bring you along. And so 11 years later, he comes and invites Svasti to be with him. And it is truly a dream come true for this boy who has not forgotten for a single day the tranquility, the serenity, and the presence of this being. But also he has to leave behind his entire life. You know, leave behind his sisters and brothers who are now old enough to take care of themselves. And I just think it's an interesting thing to consider, you know, in the very first chapters of this book, when we truly engage on a path of spiritual awakening, we have to leave a lot behind. It's not as drastic as, you know, putting on robes, releasing all of our worldly items and sleeping in the forest using a root branch of a tree as our pillow. But we are, we're letting stuff go and it can be painful. We're letting people go. We're letting goals go. We're letting different forms of success that maybe drove us in other parts of our life go. And I'm curious to hear from folks here. Have you noticed that? Has there been some time on your path when you've recognized that there were things that you had to let go that just kind of no longer were able to serve you in this context? I see a lot of nodding heads. <laughs> Anybody willing to share something they've noticed? Okay, I see a, yes, a hand there. Uh, I'm curious, maybe more like yes to let go that I have to let go, but also what I experienced that things fell away that mm. didn't serve me anymore. So it, it, the universe let go on behalf. Probably I held on too tight, I gripped, but then I'm grateful that there were some interventions. Beautiful. And um, when you say they, they like fell away, could you give us an example? I just, it would be beautiful to hear. <laughs> Um, hmm. you know in some ways um, actually a lot fell away mm. it, it was my job mm. it was my husband mm. it was my my home, you know, a lot fell away. Mm. And I think it's okay. I'm not judging that and I'm not judging bad. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was time for, I, I call it also a recycle it was, or a renewal. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we, we know we don't get married to get divorced. We right. don't become mom mm. to the 50% mom, but yeah. you know, it's, life and yeah life has to recycle yeah thank you yeah and I think what you're highlighting is there's like a, a natural renunciation sometimes right of what doesn't serve us it's like oh I kind of don't want to binge watch Netflix all night because my practice in the morning kind of sucks after that and then there's also the reality that when things fall apart like, that's when our practice really shines right? When it shows itself to us as maybe something that's more reliable, not all the time, many exceptions, right? There's times when our practice just feels hard, even though everything around us is hard, especially physical injury, illness, but there's also a way that it can really be uh, revealing. And again, when we look at, you know, the way that the Buddha started setting up his community, it's so funny. Um, in the book, they start and they have eight precepts, right? Then there's 111 <laughs> that the monastics have to follow. Goes up to 122 and they decide to just let it keep going because it's hard to live with people. Even if everybody has consciously chosen that they want to dedicate themselves to waking up, there actually is like quite a lot that's needed to support that on the path. And the way that he's organizing this is really trying to, at, at, at every possible way, simplify our life to kind of make a clearing so that we can practice more easily. Like it's, um, 
You know, I've heard some teachers talk about on retreat, not eating too much at lunch. And you're like, that's the only thing I look forward to. Like, and you're telling me on the silent retreat now, I can't eat a lot at lunch, right? And then you're there in your afternoon practice and you're like, you know, and, and you have to feel that and realize like, what are the things that might prevent me from training the mind, the heart and the body in the ways that I feel called to? Um, some of the other things that can be really hard is leaving people behind, right? Like people we've known our whole life, family members, not my dad, he's here tonight with us, um, but folks where it just is no longer as, um, it's hard, right? Like we have a new point of view or perspective on what is a goal, what is an aspiration, and it may no longer fit. Especially for me, I noticed with folks who are really into complaining and blaming. And once you kind of reach over the hump of like, oh, blame doesn't work that well. It's like, I'm implicated, creates more pain. Listening to it becomes really hard, right? And hard to be supportive. Not only do you not want to listen to it, your friend probably wants you to be like, yeah, get them, tear them down. And all of a sudden that doesn't feel like it is the most helpful way. Is there a hand online? Yes, great. Um, <laughs> oh, excuse me, my voice. <laughs> Claudia, maybe you could read what Maria wrote in the chat because my voice is just terrible right now. Could you? Hmm. Uh, thank you. Claudia, I think you're muted if you're trying to read it. Can we unmute Claudia? Okay, now, all right. So, yay. yay. So, Maria said, I noticed this falling away, usually after the fact, like watching television. I noticed one day that I hadn't watched TV in like a year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm not trying to say, I really don't want to come across that in order for us to pursue a spiritual path, we have to give up all the enjoyable things, like not at all, right? It's but being in right relationship and figuring out what that looks like for us. And I get why the Buddha really encouraged his followers because he wanted them to wake up ASAP, right? He recognized all the difficulties of leading the conventional life and wanted his, his bhikkhus or his monks to be able to start teaching and sharing more and more. So his decision was like, let's remove as much as possible of the daily difficulties one of the other things that was really, you know, a part of the daily life of these bhikkhus is that they beg for their food. They rely on generosity. They're in community, right? So every village that they go to, they kind of very silently, very quietly line up to receive food. And you think about especially these princes in this time who are used to having everything they could ever imagine and more presented to them without lifting a finger and the humility and vulnerability of that. And it's an interesting time we live in where most of us can have the illusion that we can be separate, completely independent, self-sufficient. It's, it's a fantasy, right? We all, always need others. Everything that we do and experience, the print on this book, the pages, right? It's all a combination of so many beings who made this possible. But I think this, this struggle or challenge of being able to be vulnerable and ask to really receive in that way, it's an incredible teaching. And I'd be curious from folks if they've had that experience where they really needed to ask for help. They need to kind of have that humility and vulnerability and how that was for, for practice, what that, what that felt like. Yes. Ask for help. 
um, and especially help with things that I've always felt that I have to just take care of myself and food definitely is one of those things like how basic is food if I can't get my own food what's wrong with me mm. and in the beginning of the pandemic um, I had a COVID scare and I was supposed to be isolated for two weeks mm. and I had no way of getting out there and getting food and um, mm. I asked for help on Facebook and people brought me food and left it by my door mm. and not only was it food it was specific food that they knew I liked and hand sanitizer and other things and it was incredibly humbling and magically um, rewarding to know that there are other people that want to help you yeah just as much as you want to help other people like I like helping why don't I give my friends and even strangers the opportunity to feel good mm. to help me? Yeah. Yeah. And also feeling that I deserve help. Yeah. That's a huge one, right? Like I can be pitiful enough to ask for help, but the fact that I'm a whole human being that deserves help from other people. Wow. Mm. Like, wow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Really happy to hear about that experience and, you know, I think maybe the pandemic for some of us did highlight that that deep need for others and sometimes like lack of uh, feeling of support. And then when it came, it can feel so incredibly good. And you point out, which, you know, we know quite well uh, now is giving to others is literally one of the most rewarding things we can do at the level literally of the reward centers in our brain like it feels very good to give uh, the Dalai Lama often says if you want to be happy practice compassion if you want others to be happy practice compassion right this idea of the offering and you also highlight the struggle of feeling as though we deserve it right and it's so interesting with these bhikkhus or with the monks they all shave their head. They all wear the same thing, just kind of tearing down as much as possible this idea of you're some sort of special individual and lifting up the idea that you, like every single being, deserve this, this kind of fundamental aspect of being cared for, being loved. And indeed, the in especially, th this is still true, um, many parts of the world that practice um, Buddhism, and it's very alive today, that offerings is a really big deal. Presenting an offering at a stupa, presenting offering at a monastery, it's a, it's a total gift. And you'll see, um, you know, these beautiful offerings, especially on holy days, like marigolds and incense, and, and then the food that is offered too in the monasteries, usually symbolically, but that idea of the way that you can engage with your practice is, is the offering. Um, yeah. Anyone else have any thoughts on that challenge of vulnerability? I, I'm not sure if you can progress on the path without it. I don't think so. I think if there's a sense of, I'm going to do this meditation thing so I can be better and I'm going to just you know, effort my way through and I got it and I got all the books and every podcast and, you know, I'm tracking um, and there's no vulnerability. I, I don't know how deeply the teachings can, can move through that sense of interdependence. It, it can't be something you read about. It can't be something you're only practicing with your eyes closed. It has to be very felt, a real understanding of the preciousness and fragility of being a human being with other human beings. Yes. Sure. Yeah. We're having requests for people to speak like, like, thank you. Hi. Uh, um, my name is Josh. And it's, uh, this is very, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the synchronicity of this hmm. conversation is uh, amazing. Last night, I went to a reunion of um, all of my men friends from the last 20 years, not all of them, but many of them for the last 20 years in San Francisco. 
And um, it was so fascinating to feel how, how vulnerable I felt going mm -hmm. into the um, event and who came to my side mm -hmm. and, and was there for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also who I was letting go of hmm. and, um, it was so present. And then today just, um, you know, thinking about letting those things go away, hmm. not just those people, um, some of some old friends, um, but also parts of my life that I've shared with them over the years um, has drifted away. Yeah. Um, hmm. And so it's just fascinating to, uh, <laughs> to actually participate in this conversation. Now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I, I was, I was mentioning to my dad as we were driving over here um, so many different lifetimes in a life and the older you get, you know, my dad's 88. He's had more than most of us here, but so many different lifetimes. And when you're in it, you have no idea there'll be a different one. It's so consuming. And I think one of the things I really enjoy about this book and in general kind of narrative fiction and otherwise, seeing how all the points in the story show up. A lot of the pieces of Buddha's life before he wakes up are not so great, right? Like he... There's very different accounts in this book. They're much kinder to him, but he leaves his wife and barely one-year-old baby, right? That's one point in the story that's pretty bad. And then you see other points in the story, of course, where he is um, making his life one of service and goes back and gives all the teaching to his wife and his son. And I'm just, I'm ruining the plot, but spoiler alert. Um, but I do think it's so so meaningful to see the parts of our life that are, you know, in the past and that are truly no longer us in a way. And I think one of the teachings that we always have to come back to is that understanding of impermanence. If, if we have many lives within a life, we have, you know, we have many different ways that we are kind of dying into each day and finding a new presence and it can be so beautiful to have this rich history of who we are and who we love and what we do. And it can be a real way that we get kind of fixated and locked into a certain view of ourself. Often those views of ourself of like not good enough or comparison. And yeah, that fluidity of being able to have a sense that, you know, we're, at, we're one part on the river. And we're not sure where it's headed. We know where it came from, but not, not that gripping. And I think Thich Nhat Hanh in general, in, in this book and in his poetry, such a fluidity. He so often uses this metaphor for life as a river or a cloud, right? That it's always moving. It's always changing and shifting. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, Dean, could you tell us which chapters or which stories yes. you are reading from? Because I got the book I, on your recommendation a long Yay. time ago. <laughs> Yay. Thank I'm you, glad. Claudia. You, uh, yeah. you hung in there. <laughs> um, we're going through chapters one through three right now. Okay. Yeah. Right. And it was helpful to find out that this kid Svasti was an untouchable. But yeah. I mean, is uh, are there others? Is there anywhere that we can find out or get a little bit more of the background or context? Because I, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, it it comes up a number of times in the book. Uh -huh. Um and then, you know, it's described a little in the book, like there's a part here, Svasti was an untouchable, he did not belong to the four social castes. His father explained to him that the Brahma caste was the highest, people born into this caste were priests and teachers. Um, and, you know, this whole belief system that the Brahma actually created the human race. Um, 
and that everybody had to accept the caste in which they were born into, or the sacred scriptures taught that happiness was ability to accept one's position. I mean, just really like built in, right? And again, inequality is still unbelievably rampant. There's a different story. Instead of accepting your position, maybe it's imagining that you will be in a different one and might still create that ongoing tension and difficulty. And that's why it's um, it feels relevant, right? These teachings that are thousands of years old and the social context. So it's different, right? We don't have that many princes in the world anymore. There's a couple, mm -hmm. um, many of them are figureheads. But we have people living in exorbitant luxury. Yeah. Right. And then we, and it, it is, you know, it's not as though anyone is labeled untouchable, but there are people for whom they are invisible, right? There's not access to healthcare, basic dignity of human rights. So it's, these are still, I'd say, incredibly relevant. And it's, it's interesting, again, just knowing the life of Thich Nhat Hanh and the ways that he both engaged in direct social activism and like the cultivation of the compassionate heart, just the essential aspect of to do this work. We really have to kind of adhere ourselves to this daily practice and in some ways of kind of seeing into our biases because they are there and then being able to use that clear seeing not to shame ourselves, but to be motivation for the work that needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's such a awesome and another again, spoiler alert, but another part of this book that I don't think we hear enough about, maybe only Mark Coleman is the only teacher I know who really emphasizes the role of nature in the Buddhist teachings. Mm -hmm. And it's not as though he's saying you should love trees, but he woke up under a tree. He lived under trees. There's just so much. It's always time out the river. There's a beautiful part, a couple chapters in, in which he describes the earth and just the patience and love of the earth. The earth receives whatever is offered to it without preference, without throwing it back right? You can throw your tears on it. You can throw your love on it. And just so many ways that the use of the earth is a metaphor. And I do think it's a beautiful um, reminder that these practices can really help us deepen our relationship to the natural world, which we need to do, right? To have the joy of that sense of connection so we can protect what we love. And, you know, gosh, I do wish there, I mean, I really don't, but I, I kind of wish there was pollution talked about in the time of the Buddha so we could get a little teachings on like how to be with the desecration of our planet. Um, but I think we learn a lot just in how gentle he is in the natural world and how much it's really part of the teaching. So, yeah, let's see. Uh, Nick just shared something. He said, Brian okay. Oh, you, you muted yourself halfway through there. Okay. There we go. So, yes. So Nick just wrote in the chat, Brown University just announced prohibition of caste discrimination due to growing South Asian population in the US. Wow. Yeah. I, I also alive. wanted, yeah, I also wanted to share um, uh, something that was so interesting. I read a book called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. And yeah. she, I don't know if you read it, but she compares the caste system in India with, you know, the discrimination in this country and uh, yeah. Nazism. And uh, Martin Luther King went to India and he was very inspired by Mahatma Gandhi. And at some point he was going to give a conference and the person that introduced him said, here is our untouchable friend, Martin Luther King. And he was like, what? He was really offended when they wow. introduced him like that. But then on second mm. thought, when he, when he thought about it, he, he said, well, indeed, you know, we are in the U.S. like black mm. people like the caste system in India, we are being discriminated against. So mm. that was really a, an eye opener. Mm. 
Hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. I never yeah. heard that story. Yeah, yeah, I recommend that book. Past is incredible. Yeah, yeah. She's going to be here in the city actually in February, really? giving okay. some public talks. Yeah, Isabel Wilkerson. Yeah, uh -huh. that's right. All us up to date folks here. Um, yeah, and the oh, good. I have a moment here. The the other thing I I think is so beautiful again about just these very first introductions to how Buddha and the bhikkhus or the, or the monks are living is talking about this slowing down. So they walk, of course, to be in touch with the earth, but they really walk in order to slow down. And it is really hard for us, given, you know, the primacy of um, news, media, and distractions to give ourselves that chance to slow down. And one thing I've often done is ride my bike here or walk here when I come and really as much as possible do so without checking my phone and just attuning to what is happening. And I literally walk into this place in like an altered state in a good way, right? In a very spacious present and giving ourselves these small opportunities. I know it's so simple, but it's really powerful to do. And for some of us, we get a little more time and freedom uh, with the holidays coming up and just a really kind of strong suggestion or encouragement to, to take some unstructured time where we can, we can slow down. Meditating, of course, always going to recommend it, but slowing down and being in the world. It's great training, right? If the only time we slow down is when we meditate, I don't know about you all, but I'm definitely like, when is that bell going to ring? Right? Mm -hmm. Like we're like, so how do we bring that into the kind of every day? And, you know, I don't think they're doing walking meditation level slowness, but they're walking at a pace that's just natural, not being in a rush. Can anybody remember the last time they were not in a rush mm -hmm. to get somewhere to do something? Okay. Yeah. Our friends online will be sad. Hey, friends online. <laughs> um, just a, a couple, a practice that I have been doing for about 15 years is um, once a week, I take a two hour bath. Mm. Um, like for me, it's like a visualization meditation, mm. kind of shamanic thing. Um, my own kind of tailor made thing that I conjure. Um, and that just, um, somehow uh set resets me mm. so that i can like live in a modern urban place mm. and, yeah and have a modern urban lifestyle um yeah and then i just the other day i just decided to like go on a whim and just um go to glen park canyon in the middle of the city and just um by myself it just really slow, slow down and um, just be there and kind of forest the yes. best we can in, in Tennessee. Yeah, beautiful. So I, I don't know if folks caught that, but the, the bath, which, you know, any ritual and bringing in the visualization, smell, you know, I think using all the sense portals that we explored in the meditation when we're having that time of not rushing and the forest bathing, which, you know, so such a fancy and wonderful way of saying, taking a walk <laughs> while not lo looking at your phone, which, you know, can be tough um, and really feeling the richness. Yeah. There's just been really great research to show that enormously benefits our well-being. Um, I think that we, you know, because you can unfortunately accomplish some of that in virtual reality, I'm certain you can accomplish it in Glen Canyon in the city, right? So if you, you can do it in a simulated environment and still feel that sense of connection, then yeah, we, we are pretty fortunate here in San Francisco to have some green spaces and giving ourselves that attention to build that interrelationship with the natural world. So some folks may notice on Folsom Street, you know, we're entering the time of the year where all the leaves are gone in the tree. And just, you know, San Francisco has very subtle seasons, but so sweet to kind of like feel into those cycles and feel into those shifts and changes. So let's take a moment here to dedicate the merit.
So really giving ourselves this opportunity to reconnect with an intention. Maybe that personal one from the beginning of the night or maybe something that has arisen through reflecting and discussion. And reconnecting to the body and to our sense portals. And reconnecting to the overarching goal of these practices, the cultivation of our heart, body, and mind for the sake of all beings. Knowing that anything that we can gain in expanding our kindness and compassion is done so with the intention and hope it will radiate out in all directions to those immediately in our life and otherwise. And if it feels comfortable placing the hands at the heart to really focus in on this intention, considering that if there's any benefit of our time here together, it'd be of greatest service so that all beings would know belonging and peace all beings could experience safety. All beings could feel healthy, strong, and be free. Great to be here with you all.